Thank you ever so much, Benjamin, for inviting us. We really, really do appreciate it. And um, thank you to everybody who's joined us. So the way that we're, that we're going to do this is I'm going to explain the research that I'm going to pass on to Martin, who's going to talk about CRT and Bourdieu. Then I'm going to talk about whiteness and belonging. And then Martin's going to talk about brands. And then I'm going to sum it up. So I'm going to sort of try and do five minutes on each if we can. Um, so, so the book is, as you know, it's about elites and the making of privilege. So why did we choose postgraduates? Postgraduates occupy a liminal space in higher education. So they already had experience, already have experience of being at a university. So we were particularly interested in their journeys and trajectories within higher education. Some of our respondents were actively pursuing a career in higher education. So they were already aware of the workings of HE. So this is something that was particularly pertinent to our research. So why did we use, why did we use these institutions and how do we define elite? So first of all, there's lots of different ways that elite has been defined, particularly in the current climate, there's been lots of research on it. And there's been lots of discourses and narratives in terms of understanding the particular concept. So the way that we defined elite, particularly in relation to universities, was specifically their standing in rankings and also their measures in teaching and research excellence. So the four universities that we selected, two in the UK and two in the US, hugely well known. Um, um, I'm sure you'd probably be able to guess which ones they are, but we're not allowed to say which ones they are. So they're also defined in regularly scoring highly in the QS world rankings, but we also defined elite by their access to wealth, a huge endowments, and also the numbers of individuals who graduated from these institutions who came on to be prime ministers, Nobel Peace Prize uh, winners, and indeed individuals in the media and broadcasting. So, so they ended up in elite professions. So this is how we talk about once privileged, always privileged, which we're going to talk about later on. And most of these elites are defined by their recognizable status. And it is particularly in relation to that trajectory of eliteness in the sense that they end up in the upper echelons of government, media, judiciary, and indeed MPs. So the institutions are also based on their recognizability, not just in terms of their eliteness, but also their physical presence and what they actually look like. Furthermore, they're global. So we know what this notion of eliteness means. And Marty is going to talk a little bit later on about brands and how we talk about that in our research. So we interviewed 49 postgraduate students and we had a mixed group of students. They varied by class, by family, by their access to wealth, and most specifically their ethnicity, and also some were international and some were home students. We also looked at their prior experiences. The majority of our respondents had already studied at an elite university. So they had knowledge of what this notion of an elite university meant, particularly in relations to identity and belonging and so on and so forth. Some had been to an independent fee paying school, others had gone to state schools, but we argue that what's important about our sample is that it, it reflects a wide range of different experiences of students. But the two things that we were particularly interested in were class and race and how those identities worked to merge in terms of understanding new ways of thinking about students' experience at elite universities. And now I'm gonna pass on to Martin who's going to talk, do the hard bit, and talk about CRT and Bourdieu. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're clearly, when we were doing the research and we we're thinking about elite universities, what we were interested in right from the start is about how inequalities materialise in those particular institutions. And they are very particular, very specific institutions. So Carol was saying that the, the part of the interest of what Brands later on is that is the sort of the recognizability and the legitimacy of how these institutions are understood. They're global brands and everybody knows who they are. And everybody, you hear the name and you immediately know who they are. So when we were thinking about 
looking at class and looking at race in those two contexts. Um, I mean, we use two theoretical perspectives, which are really quite obvious in retrospect. So on the one hand, we're using Bourdieu, and the other, we're using elements of critical race theory. So particularly using things like intersectionality, things like racial realism, things like interest convergence. So theoretical means of understanding how um, inequalities of race, how uh, racism are continued and perpetuated in the research in the, in the fields where we were looking. Um, and in some respects, you know, part of, you know, when I read, we produced the book and we produced the research, some, some of the conclusions are pretty much what you would anticipate. They're fairly obvious to a certain extent. Um, so particularly if we're thinking about class, we're thinking about wealth and we're thinking about privilege. Um, in elite universities, the elite university is a very competitive space and people are clearly competing for the um, for greater, you know, to, to acquire more capital, be that social capital, be it economic capital. And in that competition, people who come into the universities, those, those sort of attributes, things like class, wealth, privilege, um, they're, they're hugely beneficial. So people come into the university, it's easier for them to get access in the first place, their experience of being there is much happier, um, and the outcomes they gain from it, are, again, they, they tend to do much better out of it than people who don't have access to the same forms of capital. And I don't think that's a massive surprise. I think that, that would be what we would anticipate. Um, you know, and in the work we did, we were very clear to sort of delineate how that happens, to sort of explain the processes by which that's happening and evidence that. Um, and similarly, I think we, you know, we're sort of thinking about race and racism and very similar patterns again. So if, we, if I'm thinking about it in terms of class, I'm thinking about the intergenerational reproduction of the same inequalities. In terms of race and racism, when I'm looking at universities, um, what we identified was very much that patterns of racism continually materialize over quite long periods of time. So we were talking to students in one particular moment if we look back at these institutions, they have long histories, long records of um, fairly obvious aspects of racism appearing, reappearing over and over again. And of the, these, the universe in particular sort of creating a language by which they appear to be addressing racism, but essentially uh, allowing and almost using racism as a means of defining who does and doesn't come out of the university with the best outcomes, the most successful um, outcomes. Um, so in some respects, that seems very much like um, we talk about things that are very obvious. Um, what I would suggest is there are certain aspects that bringing CRT, critical race theory and border together, they created some very new understandings, which I think is at the heart of the, of the book. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those in particular in a minute. So Calwan's going to talk about how whiteness and white capital and um, ideas of ethnicity and race materialise in university. And I'm going to talk later on about brands in particular um, and how that materialises, particularly using Bourdieu. Um, what I would say is when we were thinking about this, um, one of the things that came out is the idea that the, sort of the usefulness of CRT and the usefulness of Bourdieu particularly together. Um, obviously, some people have used those together in the past, but I think they've been underutilized and maybe not utilized in as um, effective or useful in a way as they, as they could be. Um, and there's reasons why I think the, the two come together. One is there's a very, um, there's a particular sort of similarity to some of the, the practice and the approach to conducting qualitative research which comes out through both Bourdieu and out through CRT. So in CRT, one of the key sort of elements of understanding how we view the world is, is you know, is understanding people's lived experience, their stories, their accounts of what they're doing. Um, and I think that that sort of idea that you put a lot of emphasis on the empirical data in order to draw out um, more theoretical conclusions is very much it resonates between the two approaches. Um, so it were, that's one of the reasons I'd identify why they work together well in tandem. Um, and the other thing that CRT is useful for in this context, um, 
So when I talk about Bourdieu and I think about the reproduction of inequalities, that's quite a sort of pessimistic worldview. I think one of the things that's been dealt with fairly head on by CRT scholarship is often the idea that you know, if we're faced with situations that don't change, in which we identify theoretical perspectives, which are basically suggesting the same sort of outcomes are likely to rematerialize again in the future. Um, almost, you know, what's the point? Why, why bother to carry on with this work? And I think I'd, there's sort of two people I'll draw into the, the argument about this. Um, one is Thomas Acton, who was the first professor of um, gypsy um, traveler work. And he always said, because one of the problems when we looked at particularly research that looked at education and travelers was this, you could look at it every 10 years, the same people would do some more research and find the same things they find out, exactly the same issues of racism materializing. And he sort of basically said, it's still worth just doing that work and just getting it out there. And the other is sort of Derek Bell, who I think, again, when he was talking about when you were faced with quite difficult um, circumstances against the idea that um, racism and the attempts to redress racism, things like interest convergence, where there's change, but it's often change that actually benefits a white population rather than a non-white population. Um, and Derek Bell pretty much says it's, it's still, it's, you know, it does us good to point this out. It does us good to make an argument about it and to, to challenge it. And I think I find some, a lot of resonance with that on board you, I suppose, in terms of someone who's thinking about their research as a political piece of research. Um, I'll pass on to yourself. So I think I'm going on to you. Long, no, that's excellent. Thank you. So in our book, we do we talk about uh, white capital and the maintenance of white supremacy and how this works in elite universities. And I'm going to talk very briefly now about whiteness and belonging and how this, this kind of materialized to perpetuate the white social order or white supremacy. So many students um, of color, for example, from less affluent backgrounds, they expect, express feelings of doubt about their right to belong within elite university spaces. And many of these were from working class backgrounds. And they doubted whether their legitimacy to be at an elite university was recognized by their white middle class peers and indeed their professors. The doubts felt by students of color about their presence within elite universities reflected their personal narratives of discomfort. One apparent irony was that their, discon this, their discontent remained constant despite the overwhelming claim of these elite universities to suggest that they were indeed meritocratic, they were interested in widening participation, etc. However, in principle, by gaining a place as a graduate student at an elite university, students in, actually experience this discomfort, particularly in relation to expressing their doubts about belonging. And many of them described their white peers by openly suggesting that their ethnicity gave them a favorable advantage. And they were often asked, are you part of a quota? Are you there because of special measures? Are you there because of a tick box exercise? And this was a means by which the collective meritocratic narrative of elite universities was maintained and indeed could be maintained while simultaneously undermining the credentials of individual students who did not possess forms of white capital. Some students suggested that they were allowed entrance into the university, university because it benefited the university by presenting a facade of institutional inclusivity to the outside world, rather than a genuine engagement with widening participation policies. And this is also evidence um, in Derek Bell's work through interest convergence. So yes, of course, universities, especially elite universities will engage in these inclusive measures, only if it benefits them more than the groups at which it was aimed. So Nima, a black working class student, described how her peers made jokes about her benefiting from, for example, affirmative action policies in the US, and then explained that this produced lingering doubt about whether or not she deserved to be there. And I quote, Sometimes I do wonder whether I'm filling a quota. I'm often asked that. 
I wonder whether, did I get here because of some sort of affirmative action measure or was it some other special measure? And, and I feel that I sometimes are, am made to feel that way by my peers and even my professors. Even though I did go to an Ivy League university as an undergraduate, there is still the sense about how come you are here? How come you are occupying this place? This is not a simple question. It's always for me about who I am and what's my story. I've been told so many times by students that those who apply for this program are only a handful, literally a small handful only get in. So am I there? Am I here for another reason? So what was particularly pertinent about our research was that students identified forms of cultural capital associated with whiteness that benefited white students within elite universities. Although narratives of affirmative action policies were inaccurate and did not reflect evidence that students of color were less likely to be successfully admitted to elite universities, they still retained a significant cur currency amongst white students. This was a narrative that, that devalued the capitals of students of color and reasserted the greater value of capitals which were held by white students. Furthermore, the willingness of some white students to openly make these claims, sometimes which were often couched as jokes, demonstrates white capital's effectiveness as a dominant form of power within the elite university. And in doing so, we argue upholds a system of white supremacy. So I'm conscious of time, but I'm just going to finish, if I may, on one last bit on this, and then I'll pass on to Martin, who's going to talk about brands. So the most significant finding to emerge between our students and our research was this notion of a sense of belonging. And this is where the intersections around race and class are really, really important. These were clearly defined by multiple different factor, factors, such as, of course, education, past educational experiences, family circumstances, geography, geography chance, and indeed luck. Unsurprisingly, we argue race and class were often associated with all of these and other factors that determine outcomes. Whiteness as both a phenotypical marker of identity, but also a visible marker of types of behavior, of different beliefs and attitudes was a consistent feature of elite universities. White forms of capital, which again materialize as a range of characteristics, a range of behaviors, attitudes and beliefs are heavily weighted as the most effective forms of, ca of capital. Graduate students at elite universities were in essence engaged in a, in a competition for these white capitals. Many students of color were disadvantaged in that competition because they did not bring pre-existing white capitals to the university. They were effectively disadvantaged by having access to less or indeed less effective capitals within this elite university. So we argue that this notion of the reinforcement of white capitals suggests that elite universities work complicitly to, to regulate and reproduce openly the reproduction of whiteness. Students who do not possess white capitals are disadvantaged in comparisons to those who possess more or indeed better forms of white capitals. Simultaneously, a narrative elite university meritocracy ensures that those students with greater access to white capitals and those who are continuously advantaged do so to, to reinforce their own status and position through whiteness. So furthermore, we argue that this is not equitable. This is not an equitable competition. This is based upon the legitimacy of whiteness within elite universities, which works specifically to uphold white supremacy. Now, Martin's going to talk about brands. So, yeah, so I'm going to move on to something that's slightly more, um, I suppose, specific to the research and it's a, it's, I suppose it's a smaller issue than the issue of white capital, but it's an interesting one, I think, working around Bourgeois. Um, and one of the things I, I think we were, when we started the research, brands were the brands of the university, the brands of a Harvard or a Yale or an MIT or an LSE, 
is how they work. Um, I think one of the reasons that is is, is a sense that of the, how nebulous they can be. And I think the sort of similar the, there's a similarity between these sort of ideas of how a brand works, perhaps things like rankings, um, or how in the UK perhaps the research excellence framework works, and you see the data that comes out of it, and you're trying to establish what it actually means. Um, so recently, I was I was slightly accused of conducting uh, of this work, some of this work research being a bit opportunistic. I was a bit miffed about that at the time, um, and the reason suggested was that the brand's work in particular was a, a sort of add-on to how you might understand elite university and I, and I really don't not only do I not think it is an add-on I think it was actually something that's you know when you do some work over sort of three or four years and it's built in right from the beginning it's it's not an opportunistic piece of research um and what and the reason it's there and the reason to try to is that I think um there's a sort of there's a sort of low level way in which we can really understand brands simply around Bourdieu and sort of talk them as a form of cultural capital, and, and that's fine. But I think what what was coming out of what we were looking at was was something um, slightly different because it was about how elite university brands work and how that differs from brands more generally. So. There are things about recognizability and legitimacy that attach themselves to brands. So you know, the brand of a, a Chanel or a Gucci um, or the brand of Amazon or POTUS. Um, those brands, sort of, they imply both that everybody understands who they are and to a certain extent that people are buying into them for what they are. Um, and I think when, when, when I was trying to understand how the brand might work within an economy where capitals are actually, you know, people are competing for them and they're at stake. It's really interesting when you start reading um, sort of the literature around business studies, literature around accountancy. Um, the, the idea of a brand, a brand like, you know, it has to be accounted for on a balance sheet. It has to be something that actually materializes as something that you can put a value on. Um, and that's recognized as being very, very difficult to do. It's recognized as being difficult to do because it's nebulous, because it's to a certain extent about how much people invest in the belief in the brand rather than something that we can say, oh, this brand is worth this amount of money or this brand is worth this amount of status. Um, and I'm trying to talk, so there's, um, there's a guy called Van Eeklen who, who's, who writes about accountancy, about double entry bookkeeping. Um, and he's talking about how you value brands and how the brand, he, he's, he talks about the brand as this, um, as an intangible form of capital that has to appear on a corporate or an institution balance sheet. Um, and measuring it, providing the values, it's a conceptual practice. It's a form of attribution recognition and figuring out that resists accounting legibility. Um, and, just, uh, and that sort of, for me, that, has, that sort of rang a lot of bells with how I understand, or Germ, I understand brands in the sense of this idea of recognition and legitimacy and um, also sort of floating meaning. So within lots of other things happening all at the same time, the brand is doing some work, the brand is creating and distributing bits of value. Um, so, so Borgia writes in places about brands, obviously, not, there's, there's not a huge amount of that. He, again, he talks about these sort of nebulous concepts. So he talks about things like goodwill or brand loyalty as being the things that are key to determining um, ideal commercial value. Um, and I think I've got a quote from Borgia. He says, uh, the brand fu it functions as a form of credit. It presupposes the trust or belief of those upon whom it bears because they're disposed to grant it credence. So it's the idea that the brand, we buy into the brand somehow. Um, and I think this is where, when I look at elite university brands, there's something slightly different is happening there. Um, so if I'm thinking about a lot of, so if I think about a commercial brand like uh, Nike or something, when people buy Nike, they, the, the assumption is, you know, obviously they recognize Nike, it has legitimacy, it has a value to them. But they almost buy into the brand and they become part of the brand. And that when you read the sort of way 
uh, if you if you read um, business leaders, how they understand the brand's work, is that they want people almost to be engaged in. To, when they talk about buy into the brand, they want them almost to become part of the brand and to be doing the work of the brand. So when I stroll around with my Nike trainers, I'm almost advertising Nike because it's it's to do with who I am and what sort of person I am. Um, and I don't think that's quite how elite university brands work. It's possibly the way the brands of other universities were, sort of less elite universities. Less elite universities. Um, when we were looking at the brand and how that worked and how people bought into it, what we tended to see was that the brand is almost a form of exclusion. It's, it's, um, it's almost like the difference between a selecting and a recruiting university. And the brand was, some of the work it does is around excluding people from being included in the brand. There's no value, for example, to the elite university to have, um, to double their student numbers or treble their student numbers. They don't have to do that because of their positioning. And when we then sort of look at, you know, those exclusions, and they're along fairly, they're on, I suppose they're, they're exclusions along the anticipated lines of exclusion around class and race. Um, when, when that happens, the value of the brand, because of the eliteness and because of the, the legitimacy and the, the potency of the meaning that the brand has, it almost works as a, as a means of legitimizing those forms of exclusion. So when I think about perhaps, um, and this is not talking about the institutions that we did our research in, but when I pick up a newspaper, I go on um, the media page, the sort of the endless drip drip of stories where there'll be this Oxbridge College hasn't recruited any black students for X number of years. That should be very challengeable, but it almost isn't challengeable. And I think one of the reasons it's not challengeable is because the people who have the greatest amount of control over the forms of knowledge that understand what universities are is tied into this idea of the brand. And so almost the slightly soft excuses, the slightly soft accounts of how they're tackling inequalities of race or inequalities of class are legitimized in part by work that the brand does. Um, and that very much comes out of it, their recognizability and the, the legitimacy attached to those institutions. And I'll leave it to that. So I'm just going to very quickly conclude because um, I've got half past already. So in our research, then, um, we argue that inequalities are over recognizable features of the elite university field. Evidence of these inequalities have always been in the public domain. They are not, they are not an unwanted byproduct of accumulated historic mistakes and errors of judgment. Rather, we argue, they are an ongoing overt strategy to maintain the interests of academic and non-academic elites, particularly within the space of elite universities. Racism and class inequality are the normal anticipated outcomes because the interests of elite university are primarily the interests of a white middle-class elite. We know that Bourdieu describes the taken for granted nature of social structures, including the inherent inequalities. We argue that elite universities are uniquely positioned to defend their entitlement to their status from challenge, as Martin has just said in relation to brands. We argue they are able to exert a particular form of power as the arbiters of whose cultural capital holds the greatest and most important value. And this is overt, we argue, this is not hidden. Although with non-elite universities, they are, we argue, knowledge producers. They are engaged in the day-to-day -day activities of research that does produce new forms of knowledge. However, in addition to this, their ongoing status as the most highly regarded institutions as elite grants them the privilege of establishing which forms of knowledge should be understood to be the most significant. And just as a footnote to this, um, I've just written an article, which hopefully will be out later on this year, which talks about knowledge construction as white excellence. And this is something which is 
a follow on from some of the work that we've been doing in here. So in the competitive field of universities, they're playing um, basically with a, a heavily landed, loaded hand of cards, which is their own accumulated cultural capital, which determines whose work, which people and which institutions hold the most value, i.e. whiteness. In this competitive venture, they inevitably pursue strategies to protect their own interests, overtly so. And at the micro level, these include the interests of students who sit most comfortably and whose values align with white middle class interests of that institution. At the macro level, elite universities are engaged in shaping the global economy. They do this through the successful positioning of their own people within elite positions and indeed through the brands, as Martin has argued. They are also engaged in the competitiveness that asserts particular national interests, those of Western universities, particularly in the US and the UK, rather than universities in the global South or indeed the developing world. In conclusion, and to put it bluntly, we argue that elite universities work only to serve their own interests. Occasionally, these interests might be mitigated or forced to adapt to changing social and economic climates. In the final reckoning, however, the interests of elite universities are largely unassailable. Despite being a nebulous concept, elite universities deploy their wealth and their status. They deploy their brands and their reputation to ensure that the elite, in elite universities is always retained. We argue their eliteness remains visible and always readily recognizable. Elite universities work to perpetuate white supremacy. Thank you very much. Indeed.